Let's go, motherfucker. Okay, so today I was thinking that we would talk about nitro engines because nitro is the glory, right? So before we start talking about driving or setting up your car, we need to make sure that the engine is running and we can get around the track. Uh, hopefully you have watched my engine tuning video on YouTube or in the course and uh, hopefully the break-in video also. So I, w I wasn't thinking of going over all the same things, just a couple of important points and then uh, we'll take questions and so that hopefully we can all learn something new. Okay, so if there's one, one thing that I hope my legacy in uh, RC racing will be would be I hope it's the fact that people understand the importance of idle the idle gap so did you see the picture here yeah yes yeah okay so right here that's the idle gap and when we talk about the idle gap measuring the idle gap we re remove the venturi so no venturi just the naked carb and you check for that idle gap here. And the measurement you take here in the middle, that's that's what we talk about when we talk about 0 0.5 millimeters, for example. Now, the reason this is important is that if you all know what juggling is, clowns at the circus, circus they juggle. Now, anyone can juggle with two balls. You throw one in the air, catch it. You throw the other in the air, you catch it. Like any, Everyone can do that. Two balls is doable, but when you add a third ball, it gets difficult because now you can't throw one ball in the air, transfer the other one to your other hand, catch it. Like it's not an easy thing where you are just focusing on two objects. You have two hands, two objects. You can do that. When you have a third, it gets tricky because now you have to sort of focus on two but change the one you are focusing on as you are throwing and catching balls so it takes a lot more practice to get right so how most of us tune our engine is we are juggling three balls it's more difficult you can do it but it's a lot more difficult and knowing your idle gap basically removes one ball now you're juggling with just two balls you are eliminating one variable. So you set the idle gap so you know it. You set it to 0 0.5 and then you leave it. And then you only adjust the main needle and low speed needle. What should we call it? High, high speed needle, high end, top end, main needle. Those are all words used for the same thing. And then low end, bottom end, low speed needle. Maybe we should start, try to stick to high speed and low speed. Yes. So uh, the idle gap is crucial because of that. It, it makes your job of tuning the engine a lot easier. So don't overlook this. Just because a lot of the uh, drivers these days don't measure the idle gap and top drivers don't know what the idle gap is, that doesn't mean that they are doing it the right way. They, they, if they know how to tune an engine, they will end up with the same idle gap, they, but they do it with iteration and skills and experience. Let's just uh, cover a few things before we move on. And I think one, one uh, thing we could do today is discuss sort of troubleshooting because that's, me, that's something that I haven't made a video on, and that's often the issue. So we have an engine that's fine, and then we start having problems. So I think troubleshooting could be sort of the main topic for today. But here's a quick reminder of what's going on in the carb. So high-speed needle basically 
is limiting the maximum amount of fuel that can enter the carb. That's what you're doing with the high speed needle. Now uh, at full throttle, it's basically free flow of fuel through the high speed needle. Uh, the, what was this called again? The right term, the middle needle. There was a name for it. Metering valve OS called it, I think. So the fuel throws, flows through here into the carb. So at full throttle, the high speed needle is what uh, is limiting fuel uh, flow. At idle or partial throttle, what's limiting the fuel flow is the low speed needle that goes inside the metering valve into the spray bar here. So that's what's limiting fuel flow. More fuel could flow through here, but it just gathers in here because it's limited here entering the carb. When we know our idle gap, we only need to worry about uh, the low speed needle for the engine's idle and how the engine accelerates when you get on power after idling. We don't have to worry about the, the idle stop screw, the RPM. Normally how people tune an engine is they try to get it to idle. They adjust the idle gap through the third uh, screw on the back side of the carb and then they adjust the uh, low speed, then they adjust the idle stop screw again, then the low speed, and it's sometimes tricky to get the engine to idle correctly. You, I'm sure you all know what I mean. So you have to go back and forth between different screws. When you measure the idle gap, you don't have to do that. You measure it, you set it, and that's it. The only thing you adjust is the low speed needle. So what's going on? Basically, air is flowing through the air filter down the venturi into the carb body. At the same time as the engine is idling, fuel is flowing through here, through the metering valve, uh, out the spray bar as much as the low speed needle allows. For the engine to run right, if you remember from the video or you know from for other reasons, it's a mixture of the air that's flowing in and uh, the fuel or the oxygen in the fuel reacting in the combustion chamber, in the combustion event, causing an explosion and then pushing the piston down. So we have a set amount of air that's coming in. We set it, we measured the idle gap, that's the amount of air that's going in. We don't need to change that, we know that. So the, what we are doing is we are just uh, adjusting the amount of fuel to match that the air. So if the engine doesn't idle, if it wants to die, you close the low speed needle, reducing the amount of fuel that is flowing into the engine at idle. So then it's still the same amount of air, but now there's less fuel. So the engine will run uh, leaner. If the opposite is true to where after you set the idle gap, the engine is idling and the RPM wants to rise. That means that the engine is too lean. So again, you don't change the idle gap. You just open the low speed needle, allow more fuel to flow in to the carb and the engine during idle, uh, which will make the engine run more rich during idle. So you are setting, you are setting the low speed needle by listening to the idle. That's, that's how you do it. And that's what makes uh, tuning the engine so much easier when you measure the idle gap. Ba basically anyone can do it. I mean, that's, that's really the, that's really the instruction right there. So you have an engine, it's warm, it's ready to get tuned. You have measured the idle gap. You know what it is and you just let it idle and you listen. Does, does it idle? Uh, is the idle stable? Does it go down? Does it go up? It's really as uh, simple as that. Now, are there any questions or comments at this point? 
how do you know what the idle gap should be for each engine? So I think that uh, it's been quite universally 0 0.5 millimeters. I even tr measured a bunch of Ronne uh engines. And even though that engine has a strange or different shape here, it's not just a crescent like this or a circle. It's like it has a smaller uh, circle here in the middle. Even so, measuring in the middle 0 0.5 was the idle gap he had on his engines. Like he didn't know they were just tuned correctly. I measured it 0 0.5. Um, all the different OSCs, same thing. So it just seems to be a very good uh, or very sort of constant measurement on our current engines. So is it always 0 0.5? Well, here's the thing. Not always. Nothing's ever uh, this easy, is it? Especially when the engine gets older, you could have the problem where the engine doesn't want to idle anymore. It keeps dying. Now, if you remember what I said, I said you just set this to 0 0.5, then you forget about it. And then if the, if the engine doesn't idle, you just close the low speed needle, reduce the amount of fuel going in to match the air so that the engine runs. And now I don't technically know what's, what happens to an engine when it uh, wears out and it's, there's less compression and, and uh, especially OS engines don't want to idle anymore. You can't simply keep closing the low speed needle because the engine will actually start running lean. Even though it's not idling anymore and you think, okay, I'll close the low speed needle, then it will idle. It actually won't. You'll end up leaning out the engine too much. And uh, that's something you notice by revving the engine. So you rev the engine, you let it idle, and then you rev the engine quickly again, and it will bog because it's too lean. There's not enough fuel going into the engine. So in this situation, what you have to do is you have to open up the idle gap more. So you open up the idle gap to say maybe 0 0.6 millimeters. That allows more air to flow into the engine, more oxygen, and uh, then you can open up the low speed needle a bit to allow more fuel to enter also. And then you can get even an older engine to still idle and run correctly. So over time, the idle gap you need will change. You will need a slightly larger idle gap with a more worn out engine when you start have, having issues idling. Also, it can cause, it, it can be a bit different if you are running uh, in certain conditions. So, because the amount of oxygen in the air varies, right? But if, if you have a fixed idle gap, the amount of air that actually goes into the carb is always the same, but the amount of oxygen in that air is different. So if there's not a lot of oxygen in the air, you might want to open up that idle gap also to allow more air in so that you can get more oxygen into the engine. So there are times where um, you will want to increase the idle gap from the 0 0.5. But the way to tell that you need to do that is that um, the idle to get the idle good, you have to run the engine lean. Does that make sense? So you can get it to idle, but then you can notice when you are tuning the engine, revving the engine, that the bottom end is lean. That's how you know that you, you need to open the idle gap a bit. But for most of the time, and, and uh, let's say like, 80, 90% of the time that you run an engine, you just set it to 0 0.5 and you're good to go. Any more questions about that? No, sir. There, yes. could, be, there could be a difference um, with different percentage of nitro. I have a question uh, just on the subject of uh, airflow into the carb. Uh, do you find yourself changing the size of the 
Venturi you're using from track to track, or do you typically use the same Venturi everywhere? And, and what, what kind of uh, size range do you keep in your toolbox? Is it like a 6.0, a 6.5, and a 7, or, or do you use other sizes than that? Would you say there's something of a recommended base setting? I know altitude kind of changes everywhere, but is, is 6.5 or a 7 kind of a good place to start? Uh, before we go on to sort of troubleshooting, this is really important and often overlooked. What I do is I set the carb and the throttle linkage and then without power, I just move the servo so I can feel that it's opening and closing the carb smoothly when I move the servo arm. So the angles here are correct to as the throttle opens, it, it's not pulling the carb barrel or twisting it in any way. So that's that's important so you don't wear out the carb in a strange way or risk it uh, uh, sticking. So make sure that you align the, the carb and this uh, nipple here at the end of the carb and the throttle linkage and servo arm correctly so that it moves smoothly. That's step number one. Number two, Having a small gap here is really good. Uh, I wouldn't make it too big. It's sort of a driver preference and feel to um, what size gap you have here. But the biggest reason for this is that there is no risk of leaving the, the carb a bit open when you have a small gap here. So if you have no gap here, what can easily happen is that at neutral, the carb is slightly open, and then when you brake, it closes slightly. So when it closes all the way, your idle that was set perfectly will now be too low, and maybe you'll, you'll flame out. So always remember to have a small gap here. Then, as I said last time already, I use rubber bands around the air filter here onto this screw as a mechanical failsafe. So if I lose power, the servo will always return to neutral and the carb will close. Then as for endpoints, what I do is I put the Venturi in that I'm going to run and then I set my endpoint to the Venturi. So I, I look in into the carb like this and I set the um, opening of the carb basically like one click past where I think it's just right there. So I just open the carb to the size of the Venturi, basically. So if I now have the radio on and I go full throttle, then I can still pull the throttle open a bit more, maybe like one and a half mils or so, because it's not going to be all the way open. It's only open to the size of the Venturi. What can go wrong? Why? Why does your engine not run as intended? First are uh, obvious things. So everything's been fine and now it's not. Usually uh, it seems that the low end is too lean somehow. It doesn't settle to idle. The tune is all over the place. You can't figure out why. This rubber boot is prone to breaking. So check that it's not cut into two like this and painted red. That would be really bad. Your engine wouldn't run if you, your boot looked like this, right? Normally it's a small hole somewhere. You can see it's been collecting dirt. So check that car boot. Uh, another common problem is a gasket leak. And uh, now some pipes don't have gaskets anymore, but the ones that do, they can have a gasket leak. Sometimes you don't even see it on the pipe one, but when you remove the engine, you, you can see that it's been leaking. So this was a sneaky gasket leak where I didn't see anything until I removed the engine. And then I saw on the side guard that it had actually been leaking. For me, the number one th reason for engines not running right has been bearings, but Bearings are tricky because you don't always see anything like here the front bearing you can see that it's kind of been leaking because you see dust collecting here um, Around the front of the engine and actually you can also see 
some dust collecting on the pipe. So it's been throwing oil onto the pipe also. The front bearing has been leaking. But the thing is that just because the front bearing leaks, it doesn't mean that it's bad, which makes things hard to spot. Sometimes an engine is perfectly fine and you see that there's a bit of leakage. It doesn't matter. It doesn't do anything. But then other times you don't see anything and your engine doesn't run right. And I have a video here, some audio we can uh, listen to, to show you what a bad front bearing sounds like. This was actually a brand new engine. So this was in uh, at some point after break-in when I was just trying to tune it and, and uh, I couldn't get the idle right. If you know your idle gap, you know the engine is in good condition, it should just idle steadily when you tune it correctly. But listen to what happens here with uh, this engine. So did you all hear that? Yeah. So th there's like no explanation for it. It just, it settles at one point after revving, but then it goes up again, stays up a bit and then comes down again. And uh, I have found that every time it's the front bearing. So, and it can even be new. So. Like I said, this engine was just, I broke it in and that's it. And I could never get the idle right. Changed the front bearing, boom. Idled for 30 seconds, no change. So when you have a situation like this, um, if you don't know your idle gap, what you will do is assume that it's not tuned right. You'll keep tuning, retuning, retuning, retuning. And you can never get it right and you get frustrated. If you know your idle gap, you know it's 0 0.5. You only need to adjust your low-speed needle. Ah, it's not uh, idling right. Close it, open. Ah, it's not working. So you know something's wrong. And then if there's nothing wrong visually with uh, back, back plates of the engine's not leaking, no gasket problems on the pipe, carb boot is fine, uh, you can't visually see anything wrong with the engine, then it's the front bearing. It's as simple as that. So um, I don't know if a fuel tank can cause this. I don't think so. I don't think it would cause this problem on idling, uh, a bad fuel tank. A bad fuel tank can cause flame outs, but I don't think it would cause this on idling. So. Yeah, so an idol that just keeps wandering for no apparent reason. Okay, so the front bearing, we covered that. Another thing that can happen at some point is that your rear bearing starts to go. Okay, so this is now a bad rear bearing. And what you can hear is there's like this metallic sound or like a, I don't know, how to describe it like a metallic grinding sound sand like yeah like there's sand in your engine that's what it sounds like you can you can hear that engine running and then you can hear a second sound that shouldn't be there so let's just listen to that do you hear that there's the normal idle then there's that sound that shouldn't be there that's the rear bearing It almost sounds like the drivetrain is turning, but it's not. So when you hear that, you know that your 
rear bearing is toast and you need to change it. And if you don't change your rear bearing, what will happen is that engine will keep getting louder and louder and you'll lose power. And um, especially if you're running a ceramic rear bearing, parts of the bearing will start breaking off and going through the engine, scoring the piston. So if, if you have ever taken an engine apart and you see like these vertical lines on the piston from something, it's probably not dirt that's gone in your engine. It's probably just pieces of your rear bearing. So when you start hearing that, I recommend you just change your bearings. Yeah, this was last time Robert was on. We spoke to him about engines. Uh, he said at high altitude could remove 0 0.1 millimeters of shims to increase the compression. This is actually something that uh, I've heard that we might have to do now with a different fuel with less nitro that we would uh, need to use different amount of shims, maybe less shims to have more compression. Uh, so Robert mentioned about the OS based ones, long stroke. He likes it. You always have enough power, but then the square stroke, I think with ultimate, it's like M5S is the long stroke. And I think the M3X is square stroke. Um, yes, yeah, the square, square stroke is easier to drive on small technical or slippery tracks and has better fuel mileage. Now I like the M3X actually in the square stroke. It's good. The power band is somehow, um, more controllable in the way where the long stroke engines, what I feel is at some point it suddenly wants to go more <laughs> and faster, right in the mid range, mid to top range and the square stroke, it kind of feels the same all the way. So I just feel I have better throttle control with, with that one. Any other, uh, questions about engines or comments? Break in. Do we need to talk about on, that on on this uh, that uh, Robert mentions um, he likes to drive it little little throttle only. So does he uh, use the low needle very lean then? Um, in, in a couple of lines later, he says says something about. Um, there is no. There is something about it, so I did I understand it correctly? Yeah, yeah, you mean this here? Yes. Yeah, that he says that you can save about one minute of runtime just by changing how you drive, by being smooth on the throttle and when your engine is set lean. I don't know if he has like a especially lean low end setting. But if you drive that way, then yes, you would set your engine more lean than comparing to someone who uses a lot of throttle always. This was a thing we had with reds also because when I ran reds, they introduced this horizontal uh, high speed needle carb. And I kept having issues, I couldn't get it to run right, because I would do one lap and then get on power and it would be rich. Next lap, it would be fine and then fine again and then rich again. And it was because in the sort of uh, slower sections of the track, I was barely using the throttle. I was very easy on the throttle, maybe going halfway, stuff like that. Then when I needed to go full throttle, then it had sort of gathered so much fuel in the engine that it was rich. And you couldn't get rid of that because then the low end would be too lean already and it would still be doing this and reds would just say that well elliot doesn't have a problem or mayfield don't have a problem and then you look how they drive and they're like smashing the throttle you know i'm like i don't drive the same way as them so i'm having this problem they are not you just have to accept that and they wouldn't and they wouldn't and then i finally went to italy once and i said okay here you go here's the screwdriver, I'll go drive and you tune my engine and they couldn't solve it. And Elliot was there, he didn't have the problem. I drove, I had the problem, they could see it and they could not remove it. So how you use the engine and your throttle does affect how you need it to be tuned. And also if there's an issue, some drivers maybe have it and others might not. 
uh, let's talk just a bit about driving. There's just a couple of things that I want to cover first um, before we start talking about car setup. Because it's like maybe 90% of people make these same mistakes and then the other 10% uh, actually sort of get it for some reason and don't do this. So what 90% of us do is we drive way too fast and do everything with a way too much ambition. Usually it ends up in disaster and always, it always ends up in slower lap times. So what I mean is like every input, like uh, steering, throttle, whatever we do, we just do it t too much, too far and too aggressively. And the thing I would say is like, how do you drive your real car when you drive, right? You have to do a 90 degree corner into uh, a parking lot. How do you do that? How do you brake? How do you turn? Because if you look how most people drive an RC car, it's basically slam on the brakes, turn. Now, no one does that in their real car, right? They brake gradually, start turning. Everything's a smooth motion. And you slow down, turn, accelerate again. And that's really the key point. Like, that's what uh, I would like you all to remember. That if we want to improve as drivers, we should uh, drive smoothly so apply throttle in a smooth fashion brake in a smooth fashion use a steering uh, smoothly and that will allow the car to reach its full potential and that's going to be a lot more clear tomorrow when we start talking about how a car is supposed to work the way you can get the best performance out of a car requires you to drive it within a certain working range, as I call it. So all the movements of the car, they need to be within a certain range. And if you are too aggressive, you push the car outside of that range and no setup will actually be uh, good enough for that, right? Uh, even when you look at the best drivers in the world, what they are doing is they are constantly looking for the limit they are looking for the limit of how far they can push the car before it starts going wrong so going wrong can mean that uh, the car pushes a lot or the rear end slides out or it catches a bump and flips over uh, there are many different ways that a car can be pushed too far or maybe accelerating out of the corner the car wants to squat down on the outside rear tower tire too much and maybe the front inside tires up in the air you know these kind of things so the car goes outside of its working range because it's being pushed too hard and the best drivers in the world can sense this so they look for the limits of the car and they drive the car within that so my point is, I guess, for everyone here to understand first that before we start talking about adjusting the, the car setup and learning about setup, we first have to know how to drive correctly. We have to get some sort of connection to the car so we understand what it's doing and we can drive it within this, this working range. So even for drivers who are already good and experienced very often they can go faster if they just focus on this a bit so uh, just driving around the track and then actually sort of focusing on on uh, what the car is doing and trying to be smoother with all the inputs maintaining your corner speed around corners not allowing it the car to roll too far for example or or turning in smoothly 
to not break traction, accelerating smoothly to not break traction. If you focus on these things, it's very often the case that you will actually lower your lap time. Uh, the last thing I'll say is I remembered in the course I mentioned it, this scene from a movie, Scent of a Woman, where Al Pacino is a blind guy and uh, he gets out of a taxi and, and a guy that's helping him uh, grabs his arm. And then Al Pacino grabs his arm back and says, Us, are you blind? And the guy says, no. And why, why do you grab my arm? I grab your arm. And the reason for that is that if the other guy grabs Al Pacino's arm, Al is blind. He doesn't know where they're going. Suddenly he'll, he'll just get you know, pulled in one direction or the other direction. He doesn't know at all when to stop, when to go. He's just reacting to what this other guy is doing. But if Al grabs the other guy's arm, he can sense through feeling the movement of the other guy's arm and body where they are going, even before they go there. He can sense that we are about to turn right now and he can follow, right? It's the tiny uh, movements and gestures and feelings that you get that uh, help you understand what's about to happen. And that's the way you should think about your car. Your car doesn't know what's about to happen. It's blind. You have to show the car that I, n I want to turn right now. So that's at least how I think about it. And it helped me. It helps me to understand how to drive my car. The, my car is blind. It doesn't know what the hell is going on. I have to introduce the idea of turning now to the car, you know, and the better I do that, the faster I'll be. Here we can talk a bit about the difference between a really top driver and most drivers, right? So the more steering a car has, the more aggressive it is, the more initial grip the car has, the faster you can be because the peak of traction is higher and the car responds very quickly to everything. But the problem is that it's harder to drive. So you have to have higher, a higher skill level to be able to get those benefits. So most of us, an easier car, which isn't as responsive, doesn't have as high of a maximum traction peak, will be a lot easier to drive. The reason is that when David Ronnefalk picks up the transmitter and starts driving, his internal driving an RC car computer starts working, right? He gathers data for a lap or two laps, and then he knows what to do. Everyone else is like, <laughs> we gather data that entire time we're out there, and tr we're trying to adapt and trying to figure out what to do. Like, we we can't get to that level that he can get to, at least not as quickly, right? So he can drive a car that's harder to drive because he adjusts his inputs perfectly and he will hit the same mark every lap and he will turn the steering just the right amount and pull the throttle just the right amount. And that's not something most people can do. So what we do is we kind of dumb the car down for us and what that means is it allows for us to be more imprecise. So we turn the wheel a bit too much this lap. Nothing really happened because we don't have that much initial steering. Then we can sort of uh, correct that. Uh, f we turn too much first, then we can see that, oh, the car is turning a bit more than I wanted and we can adjust. Nothing drastic happened. With uh, Ronne Falk set up, that you would have already crashed or lost a lot of speed because of oversteer or something like that, right? Same thing with the throttle input, that when you get on power, maybe you pull the trigger a bit too much, doesn't matter. The rear end is very stable, doesn't squat too much. Maybe on David's car, it would squat too much. L let's say normally skilled drivers versus elite drivers require different things from there setups because I think contrary to 
many other sports, in RC, the less skill you have, the harder you actually push the car. Um, in real, like full-size racing, like motocross, I don't push the bike as hard as a really good rider because I, I don't want to kill myself or hurt myself. And also because I don't even have the skills to do it. Like I cannot do it. Like even if I now wanted to go into this corner and do something ridiculous with a bike, I can't. I don't know how. It's fucking too difficult. Uh, in real car racing, same thing. Uh, if you aren't good enough, then you will pretty much crash immediately if you try doing a corner too fast, right? You don't have the skills to really push the cars to the limits that good driver, uh, good driver could. But I feel that in RC, we all have the skill to pull a trigger and turn a wheel, right? So what less skilled drivers do is they actually push the cars harder than the really good drivers. Does that make sense? The, uh, there's no penalty for it. You can crash, you don't get hurt, you can keep on crashing. The really good drivers only push the car to its limit. Less skilled driver, we push it over the limit repeatedly. And that's why to be faster, for most people, it makes sense to make the car easier to drive. So it's less punishing if you do push it over the limit. And also, like David was talking about the servos, maybe if we have slower servos, not too slow, just slightly slower, or we limit our endpoints on steering slightly if we have, if we feel we have too much, or if we limit the power, Samuel, on electric, limit end point on throttle, on nitro, rich in the engine a bit maybe. Like if we if we do these things, we will most likely actually benefit and go faster because we are limiting power, we are limiting steering, we are making the car more forgiving. One thing can I add, which is more probably along the lines of down to transmitter setting, but something like what I do with the Taba, we have speed for um, turn and return um, on the servo through the transmitter. So we're indoor racing, we're kind of always trying to dial back traction a little bit from a new set of tyres. So we'll, we'll start somewhere, maybe like a speed of minus 10 or 12. And as a tyre wears in for consistency and feel, we'll actually, I'll actually dial that back into say 100 on the turn. And that's something we use in the transmitter. Quite a lot of our guys at our club do that. Yeah, so, so I don't myself slow the servos down, but I have heard of people doing that. So just, for example, lowering the speed of the steering servo, so it's 90 or 85 or something instead of uh, full speed or, or throttle even. So it could be worth trying to do that if you have some fancy all metal case, super fast servos, it could make sense to try. But what I would maybe recommend even more than that is to just try some negative expo. That, that is really good because it reduces that initial response of the servo, but you still have the speed there when you need it. So I wouldn't go overboard with that, but let's say 10 to 10 to 20% is already noticeable. So for example, I've recently uh, started driving some touring car now and I haven't driven touring cars in like 10 years or more. And when I first drove, it's like insane, the speed. So I'm like, holy shit. Um, did I suddenly get old or what? So what I did was I added some expo on the steering. I went to like minus 15. That felt good. It's, it's still sort of logical. It's just that in the initial steering response is less. And then I actually lowered the endpoint on my radio instead of messing with the speed control settings. Endpoint on radio, on throttle to 80%. And then once I drove consistently, I went to 85. When I was consistent, 90, then 95, then 100. Then I started making mistakes. I went back to 95. Then the next day, I 
achieved 100% in endpoint for throttle and consistency. But I kept the expo for the steering. So adjusting your radio also to make your car easier to drive, especially if you are adapting to a new car or new track or something like that, it can really help. Oh, this picture doesn't even show it because of this box. But basically on the servo arm, there's often different locations to at attach the throttle link. Now, what I like to do is on the Mayako and also the JQ, there are two different holes here, long and a short. Now, I like to use the short hole because what it does is it effectively, it slows the servo down, right? Because now the, the lever arm is shorter. So the servo has to move a longer distance to pull the throttle. What it does, it, it just smooths out the throttle input a bit. And with the servos I use, radio I use, I prefer the shorter position. Now, if I go to the longer position, then I will feel that the throttle response is more aggressive, more direct. So that's also an, yet another way to tune um, your response. And the same goes for the steering. So it, the length of the steer, steering servo arm will affect uh, your steering feel also. So that's also an adjustment you can do. And my recommendation would be that you go for the shorter option because it will be it will most likely be easier for you to drive less responsive smoother operation easier one thing that people always are sort of fixated on somehow is that well one is that oh the servo arm should be somehow like perpendicular to the servo itself or something like that mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. completely irrelevant. That that doesn't change anything. What is relevant is the angle of the servo arm in relation to the bell crank here, and mm -hmm. this arm. Um, it doesn't have to like, depending on the design, it it might be at a weird angle like this. For example, it looks like okay, the wheels are straight, but this is not sort of perpendicular to anything. It looks wrong, right? But it it's that's not a relevant angle to think about. Uh, what's relevant is that the movement of the servo arm and the bell crank is is uh, equal. Also, the lengths of these affect that. What, how do you know that it's correct? Well, you can adjust the length of this steering link here, the link between the servo arm to the bell crank. You can adjust the length. If you have equal steering left to right, your end point will also be equal on the radio left to right. So that's basically how you know, and that's, that's what you should adjust for. So you set the steering to be straight with your radio. So wheels are pointing forward. You know that the steering is in the center and then you set your end points left and right. And if they are very different, you have to change the length of this link. And you can find the length where your endpoint setting left and right is equal. And then you basically have equal left and right uh, steering. Does it? Yes. Neo with the last question. Yes. Yeah. We talked a lot about electronics. Okay. So, as I am Italian, the question is, have you ever tried the gyro? And, you know what? Uh, and wait, yeah. I know what I'm talking about. So mm -hmm. I tried it. I know how to use it. And I know uh, what can be the, the improvement using it and yeah. how to use it. Yeah. And you? Okay. So, um, one thing that I want to do with my YouTube channel yeah. is tests like this, for example. So get the gyros, try the gyros, test, uh, compare lap times, these kind of things. I would find that interesting. Yeah. And also to use a gyro with someone like Ronne Falk, you know, so someone like me, someone yeah. like Ronne Falk, even a more beginner driver and really like have yeah. actual 
understanding and evidence of things instead of just bullshit posting on Facebook or something, right? So that, yeah. it's something I want to do. Another example of something similar is testing all different tires and uh, comparing differences and putting four different tires on your car and doing a lap time and seeing the difference, right? These kind of tests would be fun to do. So uh, tomorrow we continue. Tomorrow we start talking about cars. But just remember, for anything of that to really make sense, you have to pretend that your car is Al, Pac Al Pacino. Okay. The car is blind and you need to introduce every new idea to it smoothly. Like, let's, let's go this way now, right? Let's okay. accelerate now. Let's break now. So smooth inputs. Don't overdrive it. Drive only push the car to the limit that uh, it allows you to push it to, you know, don't go over that. Because yeah. then everything that we learn now and talk about will make sense. And then you can understand how you can go faster. 